This is a response to a video by popular YouTube personality John Green critiquing Thomas Malthus's model of population growth. The video promotes a very common misconception of enthusiast economics, which I will attempt to correct. I shall start off with a brief overview of the model and its predictive implications as outlined by Malthus in the first edition of an essay on the principle of population. A very basic version of Malthus's demographic theory relies on three basic postulates. Number one, the growth and decay of human populations is exponential. Number two, the growth of agricultural productivity is algorithmic in the long term. And number three, increases in material living standards causes increases in birth rate and decreases in mortality. The first postulate is the least controversial and stems from the distributive nature of reproduction. Consequently, the population's growth is proportional to the current size of the population, with the proportionality constant being the yearly birth rate minus the death rate, called k. This is the basic description of a geometric progression, which assumes a constant k. Classical production theory gives us three basic factors of production, land, labor, and capital. To illustrate the mechanism behind the Methusian trap, we can picture society as a farm with a population of farmers. Like society in general, this farm has a fixed amount of land. Doubling the amount of laborers to work the same amount of land may, in the short run, double the rate of production. Continuously doubling the labor supply, however, will not increase the rate of production by the same magnitude. In the long run, what we have to contend with is the law of diminishing returns. At some point, adding more farmers will reduce the product produced for a farmer. Regardless of how the resources are distributed, strictly increasing the population would lower the average material living standard. Beyond the threshold, lowering the living standard would result in a higher death rate. Malthus also believed that it would lower the birth rate, but this isn't critical to the theory. The living standard will lower until the birth rate equals the death rate, resulting in zero growth. Now assume there exists sporadic increases in technology and human capital. The model predicts that with the average increase in productivity of each farmer, material living standards will rise and the population will increase. However, if the increase of productivity does not progress faster than the growth of the population, the average wage would tend to a subsistence value in the matter described above. This leads to a very counterintuitive prediction. Sporadic technological development does not raise material living standards in the long run. While there exists pretty much universal agreement in ecology that population growth among plants and animals is exponential, density-dependent self-imitation is a bit more controversial. Debate currently centers around finding a suitable definition of density dependency and what all the suitable methods for verifying whether it is a regulating factor in a given population. Recently, advancements in statistics and a greater availability of data has led to a more widespread acceptance of density dependency of growth rates in ecology. Now, it may seem reasonable to question whether this model predicts human populations as well as it does for other organisms. In his video, John Green makes three objections to this end, which I would like to examine. Number one, Malthus's analysis of technological advancement was limited to England. Number two, modern famines are not natural. Number three, the unparalleled agricultural productivity of China serves as a counterexample. The first objection is based on a belief that Malthus's observations were skewed by his limited focus on the agricultural revolution in England, which was facilitated by the seemingly harsh Land Enclosure Acts. This objection, along with Green's overall video, seems to portray a narrative that Malthus created an abstract description of reality from limited observations void of an appreciation for complexity. This narrative is inaccurate. In fact, a basic reading of the later editions of an essay on the principle of population would tell us that Malthus, 
while relying heavily on an observation of the English, examined many other cultures. Some of the initial justification Moffat used include Benjamin Franklin's observation of geometric population growth in North America as a result of an overabundance of land, as well as reports from James Cook, Mongo Park, and William Jones on the population dynamics in the Pacific Islands, Africa, and India. He did not, however, strictly line anecdotal accounts. He gathered data from an extensive amount of sources. He used population statistics as well as the price of commodities that were gathered from across continent or Europe. Malthus also traveled extensively and collected data on a large amount of variables, from marriage rates to weather patterns. Some of his more nuanced observations came from his travels in Scandinavia, after which he described economics more in terms of tendencies rather than iron rolls. Green's next objection is that famines are not natural. By natural, he means that famines are the result of an uneven distribution of food rather than absolute scarcity, a position Green attributes to Malthus. So, are famines inevitable in a Methusian trap? As defined above, the subsistence wage is the wage at which birth rates equal death rates. It is not necessarily a wage that is barely sufficient to sustain life. In many cases, it may be several times that level. The subsistence wage in a given population is determined by the prevalence of alternative checks, such as war, disease, and marriage norms. This kind of refinement of Malthus's views were a result of his trip to Scandinavia. Upon arriving in Sweden, he noticed that while food was plentiful, the population did not increase. He postulated that not only did a century of wars with Russia kill a significant portion of the male population in Sweden, but it also altered the cultural norms regarding marriage. Mandatory military service resulted in delayed marriage, which typically has the effect of lowering the average number of children sired per marriage. Malpas also realized that abortion, contraception, and infanticide were effective checks on population growth. However, uh, he did not advocate these methods as they constituted a violation of his faith. This is consistent with a common view today that family planning is effective in reducing poverty and is one of the main strategies pursued by the Gates Foundation. Furthermore, Malthus has a more refined view of the effects of resource scarcity on famines than Green described. Here is a direct quote. The desire of an individual to possess the necessary conveniences and luxuries of life, however intense, will avail nothing towards their production, if there be no reciprocal demand for something which he possesses. A man whose only possession is his labor has or has not an effective demand for produce according to his labor, is or is not in demand by those who have the disposal of produce. For Malthus, poor relief only treated the symptoms of a deeper issue, lack of effective demand for labor. In a sense, poor relief increased the effective demand for commodities via government intervention, resulting in increased prices, and lower standards of living for the rest of the lower class, if supply is inelastic, as it would be in a Malthusian trap. This isn't to say that Malthus supported a laissez-faire approach to the issue. When he traveled to an isolated population center in Norway, he was surprised to learn that the inhabitants did not suffer from starvation after two years of bad harvests. Due to the remoteness of its location, the government mandated that farmers store surplus produce rather than sell it on the market. It could be argued that Malthus's pessimistic view of population growth was cemented by his early experiences in England. Regardless, I believe that a better question may be posed on whether his model has any predictive validity in human populations. It is difficult to assess whether Green believes that Malthus's theory serves as a good model of the pre-industrial world economy, as he made a number of seemingly contradictory statements. Ideally, we would look at 
how technological development co-varies with material living standards. The existence of a long-term upward trend would falsify the model as it predicts a return tendency. The problem is that comprehensive data from before the Industrial Revolution seldom exists. One of the notable exceptions is England, which has data that extends back to 1209. Unfortunately, different historical GDP estimate approaches have produced conflicting results. The economic historian Gregory Clark, in his book, A Fellow at the Arms, examined the historical record of nominal wages of builder and laborers from 1209 to 1800. He created a price index from a parallel record of commodity prices and used it to calculate real wages. As a result, Clark compared the resulting real wages of builders with wages from other professions with more sporadic data to check for any industry-specific divergence. The result of Clark's analysis showed no long-term upward trend in GDP per capita, despite large advancements in technology. Wages peaked after the massive population decline that occurred as a result of the Black Death, as a Methusian model would predict. Unfortunately, other methods that involve estimating GDP using total domestic production have arrived at vastly different results. Estimates from this approach show a steady upward trend. So, another way to go about this would be to examine rough biological measures of standard of living. One such biological measure is height, as it correlates with health, longevity, in nutritional quality. The correlation is strongest at the lower range of living standards, much like those before the Industrial Revolution. If living standards rose during the medieval period, one would expect a corresponding rise in height, which is characteristic of populations with rising living standards during the 19th and 20th century. Clark examined historical height across time and culture derived from 9,477 sets of skeletal remains and found that while there existed fluctuation, they did not correspond with technological development before 1800. What do we make of cross-cultural comparisons? John Green asserted that China, with its greater agricultural productivity, possessed higher material living standards at the start of the Industrial Revolution. He provided no supporting evidence for this assertion. I assume this claim stems from a tradition known as the California School of Economic History, with the central claim that Eastern civilizations were above or at parity with the West just prior to the Industrial Revolution in terms of living standards. This line of thought, however, is contradicted by the most comprehensive output-based GDP estimates. Based on these estimates, we can see that the standard of living was independent of agricultural productivity across culture before 1800.